on to uh, recording in progress. I'm going to ask everyone to start. Um, our first speaker is Parshati Dutta, and she will be talking to us about, um, this is a very long title, give me a second. Noor Jahan commanded the erection of this sarai, wide as heavens. Using buildings as biography, close reading of Muslim Empress's caravan sarai and epigraphic program. So interesting. Um, so yeah, without further ado. Fatima, you're on mute. Oh, okay. Just is is my slide visible? Is the first slide? Visible? Yes, we can see your slides. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, Firstly, thank you for having me here. I'm so excited. I've never been more excited about a conference before. Um, it's a bit long, so I'll just jump in. So my research looks at Mughal histories, which like the majority of traditional historic chronicles elsewhere have been written by and about men and have routinely marginalized women by excluding their voices, homogenizing narratives and in inquiries driven by visual culture in particular by controlling and gendering the observer's gaze. Of course, there has been no dearth of women in positions of immense power in the Mughal world, but a genuine limitation on the availability of primary literary resources and the impact of uh, androcentrism and Eurocentrism of historians have combined to produce little more than Orientalist cliches uh, until the 20th century, late 20th century. In this presentation, I argue that to redress this, there is a need for reassessment of sources and realignment of methodological stances. I am attempting this by widening my scope beyond standard textual references and including architecture matronized by women as an alternate of primary source, which I submit can be interpreted as an autobiography when read closely. My case study for this today is an early 17th century caravanserai. Uh, most of us already know a caravanserai is a travel typology. It's commonly found along all major highways of the Islamic world where uh, the caravans would take shelter for the night. This particular structure, Sarai Noor, is a bit more elaborate than the others that we see. It was constructed by Empress Noor Jahan in Punjab on the highway connecting Agra and Kabul. Now, there's a lot that can be said about this array in terms of its like typological, locational, functional, spatial qualities. But given the theme of this conference and the time allotted, I'm going to keep this to epigraphy alone. This sarai was programmed to have two inscriptions. Uh, on the Western Gateway or Lahore Darwaza, we can still find this Persian quartet being used as a foundational inscription. I have provided Cunningham's translation of it here. And the Eastern Gateway or Delhi Darwaza is now in ruins, devoid of any inscription. But Cunningham found a copy of it with a local in the 1870s, which is quite convincing and was recorded as seen here on the right. Now there exists this overwhelming positivist concern uh, in the way these inscriptions have been used so far by scholars. What I am trying to do differently is to look at it within the larger architectural context of the Sarai and specifically its wider visual environment. In this, I follow uh, Anthony Eastman's theory that emphasizes the need for viewing inscriptions rather than just reading them. Uh, because as he says, their non-verbal elements are critical to the text in the same way that kinesic messages such as body language or facial expression or movement are central in understanding the spoken word. Thus inscriptions are understood not only literally, but in, also in terms of their visibility, legibility, iconographic supplement and performative value. The inscriptions on both gateways are in Persian. And this is, this is the, in oops. Yeah, this is the inscription here, you can see. Uh, they are written in Persian in a very linear, simple Nastalik script. Uh, over the Lahore Darwaza, it has been chiseled into a marble tablet centrally and immediately above the Sarai's entrance. Um, it's clearly visible to the naked eye and uh, its legibility is heightened by contrast. That is uh, the white of the marble against the red of the sandstone. And also the, they are very sharply incised. So, the, so every diacritic, every alphabet casts its own shadow. And uh, the, the legibility of white against that black makes it that much more easier to read. Finally, each verse is broken into two and organized into these cartouches, all eight of them being then laid out in a two by four grid accentuating the inscription's rhyme and meter. While on legibility, it's also important to note that the matron's choice to use Persian, not only as the primary, but only language for inscription, would suggest an expectation of Farsi literacy. 
uh, from the contemporary world and also an assertion of the dominance of Persian language, Persianate culture, and perhaps even her own Persian ancestry at the Mughal court. The likelihood that the verses were composed partially or fully by Nur Jahan must also be considered as she's known to have been an expert user of Persian and an accomplished poet, um, and that in no other composer's name appears in the inscription. What the inscription does is that it succeeds in conveying a wide range of biographical information about Nur Jahan in this text, even as it is presented as a foundational text for the caravansaray. Um, now, as a, as a quasi-official public document, this presentation not only gives the text credibility, but as one set in stone on this monumental gateway, it magnifies its impact and gives the information more permanence than what could have been achieved conveyed on paper. The inscription on the Eastern Gateway is a verse longer than the Western and dedicates this to eulogizing Jahangir and praying for the permanence of the Sarai structure. There is a marked difference in attitude, as we can see, between the East and Western inscriptions, um, where the Eastern appears more intent to portray Nur Jahan with the sense of greater humility. Now, the sense of modesty would likely also have been enhanced by the Eastern Gateway's architectural appearance. Uh, sorry, let's put my slides. Yes, yeah, so th this is this is the Eastern Gateway, which we can see is, is much more humble compared to the Western. Um, and together, the, the architecture of the gateway and the inscription created a distinct hierarchy of spaces where the Lahore Darwaza that travelers from Persian and Central Asia would have entered the Sarai through was clearly designed to be more impressive and its inscription more grand. Whereas for travelers entering the Sarai from within India via the Delhi Darwaza, the, the tone was of some reserve. Now, arguably, travelers from India would have already been well aware of Nojan's power at court, making any ostentatious proclamations redundant here. But if the indignation noted by contemporary historians about the public being outraged by the level of power invested in Nur Jahan are to be believed, um, then the Eastern inscription may have been in fact consciously articulated to appease them with this um, more moderate uh, attitude. Overall, the epigraphic programming appears to have been designed with full awareness of its performative value, where it had the power to condition the mind of anyone encountering and entering the Sarai. But even with this concern for humility, across the two inscriptions, Nujahan manages to establish herself as the matron of the Sarai five times over. This Sarai was founded by Nujahan Begum is something that she uses thrice as refrain. Now, this verse, interestingly, offers a second layer of information to those who are familiar with the idea of Abchad, that is the numerical power of alphabets. So um, by, by making these additions, what we understand is that the date of foundation of the Sarai was age 1028, and it was completed in 1030, respectively, uh, and corresponds roughly to 1618 and 1620 in the Common Era. Important to note here is that the dates given are not of the emperor's regnal year, as was often the practice, but of the Hijri calendar instead, preempting any difficulty in comprehension for travelers from the wider Islamic world. The act of codification itself can also be understood on another level, where by requiring greater concentration and longer engagement with the text in order to decode it, the relationship of the text with the viewer is cemented. Now, prompting memory, of course, is a central purpose of any inscription, and the inscription of Noor Sarai through repetition and codification ensures that this Sarai was founded by Noor Jahan Begum, remains with the viewer for a very long time, likely because this was the section of the text that was deemed most important to its creator. The dates themselves also offer a plethora of meaning. Of course, the Eastern Gateway was completed before the Western Gateway, but what is more important is that by including both foundation and completion dates, there is a sense of pride here regarding the speed of construction. Given the scale of the Sarai, its completion within two years was obviously a remarkable achievement. Such a rapid ex execution in turn implies that it was a well-managed project matronized by a wealthy woman whose chain of command extended from within the Zanana to the ground. This is particularly worthy of note since um, one of the common characteristics of pre-modern architectural undertakings by Islamic women elsewhere has been identified as longer time periods of construction because um, of irregular cash flows and in general poor project management. Otherwise, the dates are also useful markers of Nur Jahan's rise to power. 
1616, two years before the Sarai's foundation, her title had been changed from Noor Mahal to Noor Jahan, which nearly fused the identities of the emperor and empress together, made her the most important woman in the land and endowed her with Noor or the divine light, which was so central to Mughal propaganda claiming their right to divine kingship. It appears that the political and likely financial implications of these advancements gave Noor Jahan the power to start matronizing projects of significance thereafter, where she also used epigraphic program to then broadcast her position to the steady flow of users of these structures. The idea of the imperial couple's proximity to divinity is also reflected in the choice of words in the inscription that prompt associations with paradise. So she describes the Sarai as the one which is wide as heavens, constructed during the reign of Jahangir, who is the lord of the universe, king of kings of this world and his time, and the shadow of God. Uh, this is in the Eastern Gateway, while in the West, he's described as one who's like neither heaven nor earth remembers, while Nojan herself is described as angel-like. Now in Lahore Darwaza, as uh, Yashaswini Chandra notes, the reference to heaven are heightened by the gateway's deployment of an established repertoire of motifs traditionally used to invoke paradise, such as flowering vines, flocks of real and imaginary birds, mythical beasts and angels. However, while the text identifies both Jahangir and Noor Jahan as participants in this exercise of building an empire comparable to heaven, subtle differences was, were also retained in their ranks, um, because after all, God and angel are not on the same rank, and uh, like God's work is carried out on earth by angels, the inscription would seem to indicate that Noor Jahan is necessary for the execution of uh, Jahangir's administrative decisions. Uh, this is again evidenced by the date that records the construction of the Sarai to have begun in 1618, which is one year before Jahangi's proclamation, where he orders his governors to improve the highways and build more Sarais. Um, thus, Nojan appears to have not only uh, been engaged with the execution of the royal decree, but likely also aware of them, perhaps even involved with them through their process of ideation. Uh, the idea of Jahangir and Noor Jahan as collaborators is also indicated by the inscription where it identifies Noor Jahan not only as Jahangir's hamdam or companion, but hamsare khas or, or a special partner. Now, while this particular inscription is on the Eastern Gateway, it is supplemented pictorially on the West, perhaps for the benefit of those who are not able to read Persian, with this red sandstone panel. The relief, as you can see, is... is not very deep, it's a bit coarsely finished because of course figural representation was not a forte of Mughal architecture to begin with, but they're also the only ones of their kind and in the manner of the usage it's quite clear that the aesthetic attribute is less important than their underlying messaging. In this panel, uh, it's, it's at the eye level, it's very difficult to miss, we see a woman and a man standing on either side of a flowering vase where the man bears a clear resemblance to Jahangir in his Central Asian facial features, his downturn moustache, his royal attire, while to his left, in the place traditionally reserved uh, for the consort in art from Mongol and Persian societies, the woman is Noor Jahan. She is depicted in an identical dimension, in the same stance as Jahangir, and portrayed holding a parrot, which in the context of Mughal women and the travel in travel in general had the immediate recall of the Tuti Nama text, uh, more so um, in a, on the gateway of a caravansaray. Together, the couple would suggest companionship, loyalty, equality, and co-regency. The depiction of Jahangir and Noor Jahan and the description of the relationship in the inscription are remarkable not only as distinctly democratic accounts of an early 17th century marriage, but it's also worthy of note that as a citation, that, that this is a very rare citation where a marital relationship is featured in an epigraphy because this was quite a remote occurrence in the pre-modern Islamic world. Uh, in addition to being a relationship too, too private to be acknowledged in such a public setting, it has also been conjectured that such mentions were rare because women rarely derived the power to build through their husbands. Usually they only constructed as widows or single women and their identification of selves with respect to men were then either mother of, sister of, daughter of, or sometimes widow of. From the standpoint of furthering a political agenda, and given the elite standing of Nujan's natal family, her identification of herself as either the chief minister's daughter or the imperial agent's sister too would have considerably evidenced her political clout. But the fact that she refrains from mentioning them at all may also hint at the onset of a breach between her and her natal family, particularly with her brother Asif Khan, who was Shah Jahan's partisan, uh, and who's also believed to have been responsible for her swift loss of power after Jahangir's death. Interestingly, her historians believe that the combined front of 
this immense political influence that Noor Asaf and Shah Jahan uh, presented 1611 onwards began to disintegrate in 1617. Um, however, while Noor Jahan and her and Asaf Khan may have not been getting along at this point, that Nojan continued to support Shah Jahan as an ex-successor at least until 1618 can be argued using the Sarai's epigraphy. Here we can see uh, in the first verse from the inscription of the Eastern Gateway, during the reign of Jahangir Badshah, Lord of the Universe, is actually written in Persian as shah -e jahan Badur jahangir Badshah. The use of the phrase shah jahan is, of course, deliberate, given the well-known Mughal fondness for double entendres. Uh, the consciousness of choice, of course, is evidenced by the fact that Khuram, the heir apparent, had only been awarded the title Shah Jahan one year before this was written. Um, and uh, in this big celebration, Malwa, where Noor Jahan herself had been present, uh, and this is from the Tuzuk. Including Shah Jahan's name in the gateway facing the empire was thus a public expression of Noor Jahan's support for his succession, which by 1618, in the aftermath of his Deccan expeditions, most of the empire would have shared. This appears, uh, this appears to also have been an extension of the process by which Noor Jahan was memorializing herself as part of the Mughal dynasty and its elite rulers. Um, it must be borne in mind that in the Western Persia and Central Asia facing gateway, she had already included the name of Emperor Akbar as the father of Jahangir, invoking one of the most famed and revered rulers of all South Asia across all time. Now, this inclusion of Akbar, Jahangir and Shah Jahan all together in her epigraphic program would indicate that she was perhaps effectively trying to give more longevity to her power going farther into the future and the past than reality alone would permit. So I think my time is nearly up. So to conclude, I would like to submit that we can already begin to see here that uh, the epigraphic program and um, content is designed to give us much more than just facts about the dates of erection or patronage of buildings. Like in this case, it talks about the woman's identity, agency, her wealth, her commercial and political acumen, natural and spousal relationships, Diplomatic alliances, cultural outlook, piety, literacy, artistic awareness, and importantly, her will to represent herself, to express herself, um, and, and to memorialize herself. So if we start looking at epigraphy and its architectural, against the backdrop of its complete architectural context, and then sustain this exercise across the many other buildings associated with Mughal women across the subcontinent, uh, this is a mapping of the hundred something buildings that I've identified so far, it is likely that we will have adequate information to start rewriting Mughal women's histories without relying on material diluted by colonial or male gazes. I think that's a good space to stop. So thank you. Thank you so much for that, Parshati. This was just such a detailed, close reading. Um, and I really enjoyed, obviously, because I'm, an English student, I think the idea of close reading a building the way that you've done it, um, or just a you know architectural space the way you've done it has been really, really fascinating. What I've taken away from it is the fact that Nuja was a genius. Um, we can get into <laughs> yeah, um, uh, completely, you know, I'm, I'm astounded. Um, I do want to add quickly, by the way, everyone, I'm very sorry because I was in a rush. I forgot to introduce you, which I will do now. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, but uh, Parshati is a PhD candidate at the Department of Hi History of Art, University of York in the UK. She has an undergraduate degree in architecture and a postgraduate degree in architectural theory and design from India. She has been engaged with the field of built heritage and conservation, primarily through research with organizations such as UNESCO, ICOMOS India, India National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage, India Foundation for the Arts, Cultural Resource Conservation Initiative India, Mehrangar Museum Trust, and Helen Hamlin Trust. She has also held a permanent position as assistant professor at the Sushant School of Art and Architecture, where she directed the academic track of architectural theory and methods. Her research articles and photo essays have been published on platforms such as The Wire, Scroll.in, Sahapedia, and News Laundry. So again, thank you so much for that. Um, I wrote a bunch of questions that I will completely abuse my power as chair and ask all of them at the end. Um, but again, just to reiterate that we will have a Q&A at the end. You can put your questions uh, in the chat. Uh, you can raise your hand at the end. You can send them directly to me or to the Ghost, the Savar Collective account, um, who is doing all our tech. So um, yeah, no, thank you so much. This was great. We can move on now to our second speaker. And our second speaker is, look at my list. Our second speaker is 
Amanda Katerina Leonk, and she is going to be talking to us about rethinking Mughal kinship, Gulbadan Begum's The Humayunama as a Mirror for Princesses. Um, and I'll do a quick intro. Um, and then Amanda, please do begin. So Amanda Katerina Leong is a PhD candidate whose research seeks to build a genealogy of multimedia representations of female Jawan Mardi chivalry to provide new understandings regarding intersections of race, class, and gender from a pre-modern Persianate perspective. Her research has recently won the Middle Eastern Studies Association's 2021 Best Graduate Student Paper Award and the 2022 Conference to Journal Paper Award from the Association of Iranian Studies. Congratulations. Leong has also been awarded various travel and research grants from different organizations, such as the American Institute of Iranian Studies, the Fred and Mitzi Ruiz Fellowship, the Society for the Study of Early Modern Women and Gender, and the Middle Eastern Medievalists. Amanda's research has also appeared in various magazines, ranging from Aja Media Collective, Chicago Review of Books, and also Iran Wire. So thank you so much, uh, Amanda, for joining us. Uh, really excited to hear your paper and please um, begin whenever you want. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for the introduction and for this opportunity to share my work. It's the first time I'm actually in a panel with, you know, um, other scholars who are, you know, also working on Mongol women. So I'm very excited and very thankful. And I really look forward to having a conversation with you all and your and for your feedback. So thank you very much for your time. So I'd like to begin by first introducing Gobadan Begum, um, who's like the star of my show today. So Gobadan is a princess of the Mongol Empire. Um, that is an early modern Persian Islam empire in South Asia. She's also the daughter of Emperor ba Babur, who's the founder of the Mughal Empire, the sister of Emperor Humayun, who's the second Mughal emperor and the father of Akbar. And lastly, she's also the aunt of Emperor Akbar the Great. So we can see here that, you know, she has experience, you know, the start, the start, the founder of the Mughal Empire to its peak and flourishment. So here on the screen, you can also see a portraiture of Gobadan Begum. You know, you know, it's very interesting to see the way she's depicted. You know, she's sitting cross-legged on a chair and she's like smoking a hookah. And this um, basically, you know, captures her personality. And I think she's like the embodiment of a cool aunt figure, you know? So her coolness is further seen in the way uh, she wrote the Humayun Ameh when she was 65 in Persian on the request of her nephew, Emperor Akbar the Great, to recall events that happened during his grandfather, Babur, and father's Humayun's time so that it can be used as source materials for the creation of Akbar's chronicles, the Akbar Nameh, written by Abu Fazl, his uh, Akbar's vizier. So on the screen, you can see, you know, here's a surviving manuscript of the Humayun Nameh, um, and is currently housed in the British Library. And, and to my right, you can see um, a miniature painting uh, showing you know, Akbar meeting Humayun. And if you see uh, the red circle, you can see you know, um, a female figure wearing a Central Asian headdress. And she's also holding a book and a pen as she you know, watches the scene in front of her. And experts have, um, have very confidently um, said that this is a representation of who Gobadan Begum is. So um, my argument for today is basically early modern Persian cultures have been greatly influenced by the mirror for princess genre, um, which offers monarchs advice on how to treat their subjects justly and to be model leaders. So one of the most uh, maybe famous uh, examples of a mirror for princess text, in addition to being a memoir, is actually the Babur Name written by Emperor Babur. Um, so while scholars have chosen to study this genre from a male center perspective, how Muslim women from early modern South Asia shaped this genre have remained underexamined. So my paper basically argues that the Humayun Ameh, an autobiography written in Persian by the 16th century Mughal princess Kobadan Begum, offers readers new ways of seeing how elite Mughal women redefined the mirror for a princess genre to show the power they had over their male counterparts. So this is seen from how Kobadan, by adhering to and defying traditions coming from memoir writing in the mirror for a princess genre, actually creates a mirror for princesses autobiographical text in the Humayun Ameh. By remembering how elite Mughal women from her time were celebrated for, the, for their ability to perform Jaban Mardi or a youth manliness, a Persian masculine chivalric notion central to Mughal definitions of virtuous kingship and how this integrated matriarchy contributed to the, uh, to the formation of the Mughal Empire. So with this, uh, she's able to instruct uh, future female readers on how to be Javan Marts, so as to ensure the continuation of the glory of the Mughal Empire. And most importantly, it's able to instruct male readers the need to respect and look up to Mughal women so that they can be Javan Marts like these women. So you might be wondering, why is it so important for Mughal women to be Javan Marts? It's because the Mughals actually trace their lineage through Timur and Genghis Khan. So we can see statues of them on the bottom uh, of, of the screen. So. Um, 
Timor and Genghis Khan also trace their lineage matriarchally. And so they trace their, themselves as coming from the mythical goddess uh, Princess Alan Goa of Mughalistan. We can see her painting um, uh, on the screen in my right hand side, um, showing how, you know, the, it was a very matriarchal lineage. So in fact, Timur himself also, you know, had the royal title of Gurgan, which means son-in-law. With this, we can see, you know, that um, the Mughal tradition really believed that without any strong women, there would be no strong empire. Thus, you know, highlighting the importance of Mughal women to be, to be Javan Marks. So my contribution um, by understanding Gobadan Begums the Humayun Name as a mirror for princesses is to challenge scholarship that has labeled Gobadan Begums Humayun Name as in quotes, without having any didactic purpose and lies outside the mirror for princess genre that seems to be prevalent then. I also hope to challenge the scholarly consensus that Javan Mardi or young manliness simply pertains to the sexed male body only and the need for us to recognize it as a gender fluid performative model. With this, I hope to like, you know, come up with new understandings of gender and sexuality from a pre-modern Persian perspective. So you might be wondering how exactly did Gobadan Begum fall and break the rules of a mirror for princess uh, plus memoir writing genres to create a new mirror for princesses genre. This is blatantly seen in the first page of the Humayun Name, in which normally mirror for princess texts conventionally begin with a profession of humility and an insistence on the author's lack of relevant qualifications. So we can see here, um, to the right of the screen, that she talks about how, um, okay, she's just a lowly one, you know, she doesn't have a good memory, and she's just obeying the royal command, right? So here we can see how she kind of follows the conventions. However, very interestingly, right in the next paragraph, um, you can see my red circle here, she immediately breaks the rules. How so? We can see by the way she calls um, Emperor Babur, uh, Hezrat Padishah Babam. So um, in English, we can translate it to His Majesty My Dad. Daddy. Okay, so this is something that's extremely intimate, and it's something that, you know, no official chronicler or king could ever do. So um, Gubadan flaunting and breaking the rules while also adhering to the conventions kind of shows us some sort of virtuous rule breaking. So rule breaking has always been an important feature to be a Javan Mark, with one of the most uh, famous Persian heroes found in the Shahnameh, Rostam i Dastam, or Rostam the Trickster, um, being celebrated uh, to be one of the most prime examples of uh, youth manliness on Java Mardi. So uh, Gubadan's ability to play with and also follow and expand the rules for memoir writing and mirror for princess text asserts her as the literary heir of her literary heir of her father Babur, especially when Humayun and Akbar never actually wrote their own memoirs and had to, you know, um, ask other chroniclers to write it for them. So here you might be wondering how else did Gubadan Begum play and break the rules? We can see here from the way she rewrites the Samarkand incident and the way she talks about Hansada Begum, who's the sister of Babur and, the, and her aunt in relation to Samarkand. So in the Babur Name, when it comes to talking about Samarkand, uh, Babur talks about uh, it in this way. The second time I took Samarkand, and although I had suffered a defeat at Saripu, I held the fortress for five months. The Padishas and Begs from the surrounding territories gave me no aid or, or assistance whatsoever. Despondent, I gave up and left. During that time, um, Hansada Begum fell captive to Muhammad uh, Shaybani Khan. And this incident is talked about similarly, but with a different focus in Gobadan Begum's Humayun Name, a scene from how she puts it. For six months, he, as in Babur, was besieged in Samarkand, and neither his paternal uncle and his maternal uncle sent him help. At this time, Shahi Khan sent to say, if you would marry your sister Hansada Begum to me, there might be peace and a lasting alliance between us. At length, it had to be done. He gave the Begum to the Khan and came up himself a Samarkand with 200 followers towards the lands of Badakhshan and Kabul. So here, we can see that the dissimilar events, they're very similar, but they talk about Hansada Begum's contribution differently. So in Babur's text, he kind of underplays Hansada Begum's contribution that helps him, you know, gain alliance from Shahi, uh, Shahi Behan. But in Gubadan Begum's text, she kind of recenters the importance of women like Hansada Begum. And, and with that, she's able to state their ability to sacrifice themselves so that their men, Babur, can gain alliance and peace, especially when no other men like Babur's uncle 
uncles will help them out, right? So we can see here, you know, a, con a contrast between Hansa the Begum and, you know, the uncles. Um, with this, we can see how the women were actually superior, more manlier than the, than the men, the uncles, who are cowardly and they lack loyalty. And with this, she's also able to push the first lesson um, with the Humayun Ahmed being a mirror for princesses, which is the importance of sacrifice, uh, especially, especially in women, uh, for one to be a Java Mar. However, it's very interesting that Hansada Begum is not just depicted as a very passive, you know, present of sacrifice, right? She's also very much celebrated for her political skills. And with that being said, the uh, next lesson that, you know, the Humayun Nameh teaches as a mirror for princes is for women to have good diplomatic skills and to be aware of their role in kingmaking and to have military progress. So we can see here from the screen that Mirza Hamran, who is a Humayun's rival and he was like fighting for kingship with him, you know, when he, when he was in a sticky situation and he knew that he was about to be defeated, the first person he turns to is not his other male counterparts, but it was in fact um, Hansada Begum. So we can see here, he went to dearest lady and cried and was very humble and said with countless pains, go you, may your journey be safe to Kandahar, to the emperor and make peace between us. You know, um, when she left Kabul, you know, she traveled as fast as possible to Kan Kandahar. So here we can see, you know, um, Hansada Begum is very much celebrated for diplomatic skills. She's the first one that all the Mughal men turned to. And in fact, in the end, she actually dies, you know, uh, trying to broker peace for Humayun and Kamran. So with that, uh, Humay uh, with that, Gubadan is able to use Hansada Begum's character as a way to call for women to have superlative political skills. Moreover, it's very much important um, for us to be aware that Mughal men themselves were very much aware of Mughal women's role in kingmaking, as seen from the incident between um, Mirza Khamran and Dildar Begum, who is Kubadan's birth mother and Hansada Begum. Okay, so here we can see uh, Mirza Khamran came to Kandahar four days after the Begum's arrival, that is Dildar Begum. And then day after day, he urged her, read the khutbah in my name, you know, and then, um, and Dildar Begum, you know, she she didn't really know what to say, and then she, in, in a way, she deflected um, the, the the pressure to to answer to Mirza Kamran by saying, "Oh, go and talk to Hansada Begum. Uh, she is your elder kinswoman, the oldest and highest of all. Ask her the truth um, about the khutbah." Then he spoke to you know um, Hansada Begum, Her Highness Hansada Begum answered, "If you ask me, well, as His Majesty Ferdosi Makani, that's Babur, decided it and gave his throne to Emperor Humayun." As, and as you, all of you, have read the khutbah and his name till now. So now regard him as your superior and remain in obedience to him. So here we can see, you know, by talking about how Dildar Begum kind of deflected the, the, the pressure of the question to Hansada, uh, in a way, but that's also teaching, you know, Mughal women with the, with the Humayuna as a mirror for princesses, how to deal with sticky situations like this, what they should do, you know, ask the older king's woman, they have more knowledge, they can help you get out of this situation. Right, and also um, uh, here by talking about how you know uh, how Mirza Kamran did not listen to his aunt, and how he ends up losing the war and becoming uh, he became blind. You know, in a way, she's also warning. You know, um, Empress. You know, we have to remember that um, Gobadan is writing with Akbar in mind. She's also writing for, uh, to warn Empress to listen to their aunts through the character of Hansada Begum. Okay, so another uh, really interesting um, a lesson that the Humayun Ahmed teaches is for women to be well trained in military strategies because they are the ones vital for empire building by talking about the character of Haram Begum. So here she talks about the incident when Humayun, uh, when he was about to, uh, when he didn't have enough you know, uh, troops to, to win a war, the first person he actually writes to is Haram Begum. And he, he writes a letter uh, like this, ask my Kilin to send me the army of Badakshan as quickly as possible and ready for service. In a few uh, days, a very short time, the Begum had given horses and arms to some thousands of men. She, she herself superintended and took them, and she came with the troops as far as the past. From there, she sent them forward. While she went back, they went on and joined the emperor. So here we can see, with the example of Haram Begum and women being, again, the first person that men, you know, turn to whenever they need military troops and, like, political advice, um, Gobadan is, in a way, using Haram Begum as a way to, like, urge women to be well-trained. Um, in you know military uh, in military strategy, so that they can actually contribute to empire building because it is them who carry the weight of the leadership and not the men. Okay, uh, one of the one of the very interesting lesson the Humayun Ahmed teaches is for women to be defiant and also how to use 
coquetry or acuteness. Uh, in Persian, the word is naz. So, um, and this is seen in uh, in the figure of Hamida Begum, who's actually the wife of Akbar, uh, who's actually sorry, the mother of Akbar and the wife of Humayun. So, and she talks about this incident when uh, the, uh, when the Humayun was pursuing Hamida Begum. The first, the following day, His Majesty came to my mother and said, "Send someone to ask Hamida Banu Begum to come." My mother sent someone, but Hamida Banu Begum didn't come. If he wants me to pay homage, she said, I did that ready. Why should I go again? And then the king keeps insisting. She keeps replying, to see the king once is permissible. The second time is a breach of propriety. I won't go. When Subhani Kuli reported the Begum's words to his majesty, he said, if it would be a breach of propriety, let's make it proper. So here, this incident has two different meanings. First of all, it, it is hinted that actually Hamida Begum and Mirza Hindo, who is Gubadan's brother, were actually in love with each other. So uh, Hamida Begum had no interest in Humayun, even though he's the king. So by talking about the different ways that you know Hamida Begum rejects uh, Humayun, she's basically telling women uh, strategies to reject advances and to stand strong in their beliefs and love, even to someone like the emperor. It doesn't matter. And another, another thing, another, um, another lesson we can derive from this incident is the, how we can use coquetry to get you know what this women want right because remember here she said oh it's a breach of propriety for me to like just come whenever you order me to so i'll only come to you Humayun, if you properly marry me and make me your queen right so here by using coquetry and being you know very steadfast and very you know uh, headstrong um hamida Begum is also able to ultimately become uh, the beloved you know uh, empress uh, of uh, Humayun. The scene does not end here. So uh, uh, it goes on by saying that, uh, in short, there were deliberations over Hamida Banu Begum for 40 days, but she wouldn't give her consent. In the end, my mother advised Hamida Banu Begum, saying, look, in the end, you're going to be married to somebody. Who could be better than the emperor? You're right, the Begum replied, but I'd rather be married to someone who I can control. So here, Gobodan, by uh, recalling the incident um, and, the, and the reply Hamida Begum gives to, to, uh, to her mother, um, Gobodan is in a way also re reminding Mughal women um, how they are far more superior than men and how perhaps a successful marriage and a happy marriage that will benefit the woman can only come from you know being with a man who is less headstrong and maybe like what uh, like what uh, Hamida said easier to control okay so the uh, another lesson that uh, the Humayun Ahmed as a mirror for princesses teaches is this idea of glamour politics so glamour politics is a term that I coined and I define it as the employment of multi-sensory objects such as textiles precious ornaments scent food makeup rare animals to project a powerful image of oneself that can inspire all so here I want to talk about how Maham Begum who's the wife of Babur uh, that um, that Gubadan talks about how she uses glamour politics. So my lady who was Maham Begum gave a great feast. They lit up the bazaars. Um, she gave orders to the better class and to the soldiers to decorate their palaces and make their quarters beautiful. And after this, the illumination became general in India. A jewel throne ascended by four steps and above it gold embroidered hangings cushion, pillows embroidered in gold, covering of pavilions of the large audience, European brocade, Portuguese cloth, the tent poles were glided, you know, very ornamental. My lady had prepared a tent lining and a canet and a sari canet of Gujarati cloth of gold and an ewer of rose water, um, candlesticks, drinking vessels. So we can see some examples of how the drinking vessels might have looked like and an ewer um, and rose water sprinklers all of jeweled gold. With all her stores of plenishing, she made an excellent and splendid feast. And she had 12 strings of camels, 12 of mules, seven Tipuchet horses, 100 baggage horses. She gave special robes of honor to 7,000 persons. The festivities lasted several days. Wow, it's a mouthful. So here we can see, you know, this is a representation of Maham Begum. So we can see here by recalling how Maham Begum gave such a great feast, specifically, you know, the glamorous objects she used. Kubadan is in a way telling women uh, how to use glamorous objects and to develop good aesthetic sensibility, to project power. Uh, we have to remember that, you know, it was a, a minority ruling over a majority. And with this, glamour politics was very important and in a way can be seen as like a propaganda, propaganda tool to ensure continuation of the empire. So, uh, Lesson six that uh, the Humayun Ahmed teaches is for women to bend gender norms, to practice gender bending through the characters, 
through the characters of Mir and Ghez Begum and Shah Begum. So here she talks about how these two important characters who were guests at the Talisman feast uh, that was used to celebrate Emperor Humayun's, uh, Humayun's coronation. So here she talks about them in this manner. Mir and Ghez Begum and Shah Begum, they had a lot of like, a lot of dust for each other in Persia and wore manly clothing and were adorned with different accomplishments such as cutting thumb rings, playing polo and archery. They also played many musical instruments. So playing polo, archery, thumb rings, these are all very much, you know, um, uh, Java Mardi related sports and also Java Mardi related ornaments. And here by using memory and characterization like the two begums, uh, uh, how, like, how to perform, she teaches uh, readers of the Humayun Name how to perform Java Maldi, specifically what attire to wear, what sports to play. Here on the screen, uh, there's an example of a thumb, of how a thumb ring would have looked like. Um, with that, she's, she's, uh, the Humayun Name teaches how your ability to perform and embody Java Maldi is what allows women to break the rules governing the Mughal court. You know, and it's, and it's amazing because, you know, women who broke the rules to practice Java Maldi were actually publicly given a space in the coronation feast. And it's a very important and feast for the king with their romantic feelings for each other also being accepted and remembered remember um, we, we said that you know they had a lot of boost a lot of light for each other with that with this we can see how you know the humayun name uh, by talking about these two women shatters female as separate from masculine and javan mardi as a gender bending um, protein concept with this we can also uh, see how women had the freedom to cross dress and publicly live in their javan mardi identities in fact uh, i believe they had more freedom than their male counterparts so, you know always had to maintain you know this kind of very you know image of warriors and rulers to qualify for kingship one day so i think you know in the way that Bhubadan talks about dust, like in Javan Mardi, I believe it allows us to understand female same-sex desire differently from a pre-modern Persian context. So you might be wondering, um, how does the Humayun Ahmed teach Mughal men the way to respect and celebrate female Javan Marts? So first of all, she talks about how they should acknowledge uh, female Javan Marts superiority ceremonially. So uh, when it comes to the Talisman feast, the coronation of Humayun, Hansada Begum is depicted textually, and also in the in the later reproductions of the uh, of the Humayun Ahmed, um, sorry, the Akbar Ahmed, she's also depicted visually as literally sharing the throne with Humayun. Okay, so. Here here we can talk about, we can see how the jewel throne for which my lady had given for the feast was placed in the forecourt of the house and a gold embroidered divan was laid in front of it on which his majesty and dearest lady, and dearest lady is an endearing term Gobadan uses to call Hansada Bikum, sat together. So here we can see, you know, um, Humayun literally shares the throne with Hansada Bikum. Another lesson that the Humayun Name teaches to men uh, on how to respect female Java Marts is to be willing to die for Mughal women, just as how they, a lot of Mughal women died for their men in their exploits and, and in their journey. So here, uh, we can see in this, uh, in this passage, just now the emperor said to Mirza Hindo, Akika Begum disappeared in the first Fitrat, and I repented extremely and said, why did I not kill her in my own presence? Now again, it's difficult to convey women with us. Mirza Hindo answered, it would be your majesty to kill a mother and a sister speak for itself as long as there is life in me i will fight in their service i have hope in the most high god that poor fellow as i am i may pour out my life's blood for my mothers and sisters right so we can see here these are the ways that you know gobadan teaches mogul men to not be cowardly and to kill their mothers but to fight and die for them so you might be wondering, what is the most, why is it so important for me to study female Javan Mardi in the present, you know? So until today, uh, women in Iran are still banned from practicing um, Javan Mardi sports in the Zurkhane or houses of strength. And here I want to share, you know, a uh, personal experience of mine, you know? So uh, when I, uh, when Mesa um, uh, published in their Twitter account, you know, on, on, how, on, on, on my work, I received, one of the first messages I received was a hate mail. You know, um, this guy basically saying, oh, did I anyone on that committee ask what the hell uh, uh, is female Javan Marudi, you know. So here we can still see there seems to be, you know, even in present times, a push against associating women with young manliness. So here I really hope, you know, my um, my research can combat and, try and, and force us to rethink different ways uh, with our research to fight against misogyny that's more and more uh, prevalent in the present. So thank you very much for your um, time and, um, and attention. I look forward to your comments. Thank you.
Thank you so much, um, Amanda, for that. It was, it was so interesting. And I think it was great, actually, that you shared that that message that you um, received as well. Um, and that's something we can obviously talk about where, the, the, I mean, I, I think that there is a problem with people pushing, uh, you know, Western centric standards onto uh, different cultures. But what I think is interesting is that the way that the research that you've done clearly is not doing that. So I think it was interesting that that was the first hate comment that, that someone came up with. We can obviously talk a little bit more um, about research methods uh, and all of that. I have a couple of questions again um, for you as well. But yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, and you're getting uh, some feedback in the chat as well. I encourage you to read it. Okay, next up, um, I'm going to stop talking now. Next up, we have Zoya Gul Hassan. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Zoya. I'll do a quick intro um, and then please feel free to share your screen um, if you want to. Zoya Gul Hassan is a researcher, writer, and lecturer with a background in architectural history and design. She holds an MA in architectural history from the Bard Platt School of Architecture, University College London, and a Bachelor of Architecture from the National College of Arts, Lahore. Zoya's current research and pedagogy, sorry, I can never say this word, I'm so sorry. Pedagogical interests include feminist histories and intersections of space, power, and politics. She has previously taught in the architecture and design departments of Comsats University and the Beacon House National University in Lahore. Currently on a break from teaching, Zora is working on her first short story, which explores kitchens of the Pakistani upper middle class households through a gendered lens. I feel like we need to talk about the short story as well as your presentation. Um, <laughs> because it's not so interesting. Um, but yeah, thank you so much uh, for joining us, uh, Zoya, and uh, please feel free to start whenever you're ready. Thanks a lot, Fatma. Okay, I'm just gonna jump in because uh, we have very less time and uh, I'm aware that my presentation might take a while. I'm just sharing my screen now. Just let me know when you can uh, fully see it on full screen. Okay, I can, uh, I can see it now, yeah. Uh, do you mind okay. changing the slide just so we can make sure that's also working? Uh, do I mind changing? Sorry, what? Just go like one slide ahead just so we can make sure that it's um, okay. working. Yeah. Um, yeah, just a second. Yeah? Yeah, working? Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Go okay. ahead. Right. Uh, so um, this is uh, just a little introduction. This is work uh, drawn from some of my uh, master's dissertation and some, some work that I uh, sort of continued after it as well. So I've tried to condense down like 12,000 words or something into 15 minutes, so I hope this works. Um, okay, the Mughal Empire's multifaceted history is closely intertwined with its architecture legacy. Many of its buildings and spaces in present day Northern India and Pakistan have been documented and interpreted through various lenses over the years, Building up a, co uh, a collection which is often labeled as Islamic or Mughal architecture. What is particularly striking is the extent to which a majority of architectural work is invariably stamped with the names of prominent men in power, resulting in a lack of awareness of and engagement with women's architectural work and spatial experiences. This has consequences for architectural history as well as medieval and feminist studies and begs the question that scholars have repeatedly asked in varied contexts over the years, where are the women? The ubiquitous, uh, ubi I can never pronounce this word right, <laughs> the ubiquitous image and concept of the Mughal harem as a stereotypical feminine space, coupled with a highly fragmented archive and the apparent absence of women's personal accounts relegates them to an imaginary domain of confinement and servitude. This reinforces problematic binaries such as public private, male female, active passive, mind versus body, uh, and renders invisible Mughal women's roles in the cultural, political, economic, and architectural realms. The point, however, is not to lament these silences and stereotypes, but rather read them as probes to reconstitute methods of thinking, researching, and writing. How then should we partake in seeing with fresh eyes? or to use Adrian Rich's words, of entering an old text from a new critical direction. Is it possible to reconstitute existing historical material to articulate other kinds of feminine subjectivities and experiences? Which spaces both built and used are meaningful for broadening the discussion of Mughal women's lives other than the harem? And what kinds of narratives emerge when we look elsewhere? I'm interested in other spaces that are typologically different from the harem and are associated with women by virtue of patronage, agency, and lived experiences. 
And I propose that one way of cleaning them is to read the city, in this case, Lahore, Pakistan, as an archive containing residues of the works, their stories of inhabitation and use. Other than containing material fragments of works related to female laborers and patrons and construction supervisors from this time, Lahore also contains cartographic traces, such as place names of neighborhoods um, founded and named after their patrons, physical traces of which no longer exist. Most intriguing is the enduring presence of women's in the city's spatial imagination in myths and folklore. Here they appear in multiple settings and guises, some characters coinciding with real movable figures. Women walled in, buried alive, swallowed by the earth, passive women, mysterious women, um, galaxies of women there doing penance for impetuousness, ribs chilled in, in those spaces of the mind. So situating myself in this deep burrow between silence and recorded histories on one hand, um, and a city teeming with names, whispers, and stories on the other, I read and traverse four, four sites in the city, which you can see on the map in yellow, um, an inconspicuous mosque known as Dayanga Masjid, the scattered remains of two gardens called Chaburji and Namakot monuments, as well as a solitary tomb known as the Sarvala Makbara or Cypress tomb. All of these are non-monumental architectures and um, they are associated, uh, associated with female patrons who do not fall neatly in the category of the iconic. Um, their histories also rest in a strange intermediate zone between fact and fiction, and they're mediated mostly through male voices, often in contestation with each other. Furthermore, the visual and textual reprint, uh, representations feature within records of hegemonic institutions and agents such as Sikh conquerors, British officials, colonial conservation attempts, um, or neoliberal development ventures. Lastly, all three are physically fragmented or merged with the surrounding built fabric, uh, hence re uh, rendered invisible or obscure. Considering the sparseness of women's voices in the archive, I contend that these buildings then become metaphorical bodies or corporeal presences of their patrons in the city. I trace the agents that they success that successively intervened on these bodies, altering and dismembering them over time, and how these monuments stand othered in the urban fabric, historical records, and public memory. Parallel to, uh, parallel to this, I uh, analyze them as stray swords, uh, which artist, it's a concept which I bought, borrow from artist Bridget McLear, who conceptualizes uh, stray swords as unreasonable places, sites of land, of mind, and of narrative. To step on stray sword, she writes, is to stumble upon another place, which reveals an alternate perspective. So each of these sites counter narratives of feminine subjectivity and agency, unique patterns of use, and other voices that spark the imagination, opening a door to parallel spatial worlds. So for the purpose of today's presentation, I'll be discussing two of these sites in detail, which would hopefully be covered within 15 minutes. The Sarvala Magbara, or the Cypress Room, is largely known as the final resting place of a quote-unquote pious woman named Sharpan Nissa. But, but a close reading of some written accounts reveals other details. The tower is not simply an inert receptacle built to commemorate her, but a structure that she herself built during her lifetime, using it um, as a meditation chamber before wishing to be buried in it as she lay dying. It is both a house for the body and the symbolic bodily presence of the woman who created and inhabited. First plundered by the Sikhs and later intervened upon by the Archaeological Survey of India, I frame it as a body desecrated. Interestingly, a fragment of it was transported across the seas to London by a British officer named Richard Poyser, along with other Oriental curiosities. Um, it now sits on a shelf at the Victoria and Albert Museum. That Charpan Nissa was the creator of this building is perhaps not a striking detail in itself, after all, amongst the various building types associated with women patrons, such as gardens, mosques, wells, reservoirs, travelers, inns, poor houses, were um, tombs that they built for themselves, uh, their husbands or relatives, and even revered uh, mentors. What transforms the meaning of the makbara, this makbara, far beyond what any tomb would arguably, uh, arguably stand for, is the embodied and lived dimension of this space, its assimilation into her everyday routine and its intimate connection with her very corporeality. As a popular narrative relays, she visited this tower every day using a wooden ladder to climb into the square-shaped nest. 
just large enough for one individual. Here she would med meditate and read with a jeweled sword by her side. Once the ritual was completed, she would descend and return to the palace, leaving her book and sword behind. With, with two layers of separation, which afforded some privacy and solitude from harem to tower and from ground to a height of 16 feet, Sharfa Nessa built for herself not just a room, but quite literally a room of her own. After what may have been months or years of use, she expressed a wish to be laid uh, to rest in the same space, along with her two belongings. The desire to be buried here further suggests that for her, this was indeed a territory marked as home, one that she intermittently during, uh, used during her lifetime, and one that she planned to reside in permanently. Much like it functions as a bodily appendage that uh, protects and accommodates her while she uses it, it becomes one with her physical body when she dies. Cradled in the heart of the structure, her flesh and bones seep into bricks and lime. In this light, the plunder of the tomb by the six acquires a, a fierce shade of violence, almost like the desecration of her very body. The lone tile in the museum's cold glass cupboard becomes a shred of skin, part of the colonizer's uh, collection, now merely a display. And the fading photographs in the archive read as, read as forensic snapshots of an architecture, which is no longer merely a symbolic bodily presence in the city, but it is in fact half woman, half building. Dayanga Masjid. At the far end of a dead end street by a tangle of railway tracks stand Dayanga Masjid, a hybridized body. Built by a Mughal wet nurse named Zebunissa in the 1600s, the mosque today is a bizarre assemblage of materials and forms. First destroyed by the warring Sikhs and co-opted as a gun factory, it was soon appropriated as the house of a British officer, a newspaper press, and later became a public library. As colonial building activities gained momentum and the sprawling railway complex was laid out in Lahore, the mosque was subsumed into the railway site, reappropriated once again as the office of a railway traffic manager, um, resulting in uh, obliterating the bodily legibility of Dayanga, partially contributing to its absence in public memory. Historical narratives, on the other hand, are plagued with a tinge of uncertainty regarding the patron's identity where uncertain, uh, certain historians conjecture that uh, it may have been the work of a man named Nopul. Meanwhile, considering the religious patronage of buildings was an activity that was largely the domain of women, I harness a stray historical detail which weaves in and out of its, uh, textual accounts. Dayanga built this before she left for a pilgrimage, undertaking a long journey across land and water to Makkah. From the harem where she tends to a newborn, I resituate her as a traveler treading to a place far away and enter a mobile world peopled with women pilgrims, spaces of transit and journeying, and spots of land and floating ships in the Indian Ocean. How did the journey unfold? What landscapes and terrains did she traverse? What did she experience? One of the most remarkable and only explanation, uh, examples discovered so far in the Mughal context is the band of women pilgrims led by Gul, uh, Gulbatan Begum during uh, 1575 and 1582. While no subjective accounts of the women exist from this particular journey, the translator's uh, uh, preface to Gulbatan's incomplete memoir pieces together details from writings left by certain men. The court cro uh, chronicler, for example, who may have seen them depart or arrive, or men who met them during the journey. Uh, and these provide a glimpse of some events, routes, and spaces. One sees them setting off for Makkah in a ship described in the upper Nama as a ship only for the ladies. We see them being ambushed by robbers as they walk slowly towards the port of Surat. And they also encounter uh, storms and ship shipwrecks along the way. The territory thus traversed and inhabited this in-between zone of transit itself becomes another space full of both danger and promise. As further research suggests, if one were to rewrite the history of the Indian Ocean through a gendered lens, Mughal women would not merely see as avid travelers in these watertight architectures. Several of them also owned and directed fleets of ships that were mobile nodes in economic and religious networks, and through these, women exercised a definite claim over ocean space, hiring and commanding captains, ordering and arranging trade supplies, representing themselves in fluid territories, connecting and enabling economic and religious processes, and to some extent shaping and negotiating political relationships with the West. 
As architectures of self-representation, these ships etched their public profiles in a watery world. So while the Dai in the Masjid in Lahore survives as part of the legacy of public patronage of religious buildings that women were particularly associated with, reading it through the uh, notion of a journey, through the length of a journey, as a fixed anchor at one end of a mobile trajectory reconstitutes it as a symbol of the woman traveler. It speaks of paths trodden, routes taken or avoided, nomadic uh, trajectories, networks of relations, spaces that are both frightening and captivating at the same time. And so to conclude, through such a reading, Mughal women no longer remain invisible and inactive, but feature as active patrons, supervisors of construction sites, travelers, pilgrims, and traders on the move. The seemingly inert gardens, mosques, and tombs are reconstituted and connected to a wider network of activities and spaces, um, past and present, factual and mythical, fixed and mobile, material and fluid, collective and solitary, clamorous and silent, in between and ephemeral, spaces of everyday use, um, planned rituals, and chance encounters. To borrow Edward Sovaja's words, these sites are not just other spaces to be added on to the geographical imagination, they are also other than the established ways of thinking. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, um, Zoya. This this idea of like Lahore as an archive and the way that you've explored it and the the particular monuments that you've chosen was so it's just incredible. And what I really loved about it is that you know as because I'm in Lahore right now and I'm from Lahore and this also this insistence that Lahoris have of like still referring to places by old names even though you know different governments like I live in Kent and the Lahore Kent board wants to give us all these old colonial names so there's suddenly I'm like I'm driving down Elgin Road and Old Rose Road yeah. but every you know we're still going to call it Sarva Road or Sarva mm. Rafiki Road you know we're very insistent on that so I, I really love this idea where you're talking about you know names changing and uh, and everything and it's nice that the city can still be a little stubborn with things that are so far in the past and still insist on you know using those names and remembering those monuments in whatever way and I think your work is really really important for that so thank you so much for sharing it um okay Zara we can stop recording now um for our next speaker our next speaker is my is Nayab Tufel um, we 